Well, good morning, church family. My name is Kobe. I'm one of the pastors at Ecclesia Clear Lake. I want to welcome you to our live stream worship this morning. Though we are not in the same room, we join our hearts and our minds together. We, we are very much worshiping together this morning. I want to remind you about a resource that we have for you. It's on the page where you are watching this live stream. It's a resource for communion, for you to take communion at home. One of the things I miss the most about not gathering in the same room at the same time on Sunday mornings is the, the, the act of communion. But you can do this from home. We have this resource for you put together by our Pastor John, and it is a wonderful resource. It's becoming one of my favorite parts of the, the new rhythms I'm finding myself in on Sunday morning. So make sure you utilize that. And now I want to welcome Lauren Cusro. She, she will be praying for us today. She will also be reading our scripture. So Lauren, thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing this. Good morning, church family. Uh, how are you today? I hope you are all well and safe and that your families are all well and safe. Um, I miss each and every one of you. And I can't wait until we all get to meet again in person. Uh, I think this whole experience has really shown me the value of our community and the people in it. Um, so I value each and every one of you. And um, I just, uh, I can't wait <laughs> until we can sing and, and just worship together and be together as a church and not be sort of these separate little islands um, spread throughout Clear Lake. I am going to be reading the scripture passage today. It is Luke 24 um, verses 13 through 35. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up at that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Will you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for this day and thank you for this word um it feels very appropriate actually this passage um with everything that's going on and what we're all going through right now um i feel like we're on this road um we're experiencing great upheaval and uncertainty and grief and lament 
and um, our expectations of what we thought this year was going to hold for us have been dashed. Um, and we're just feeling a lot of emotions and we're confused and we don't understand. And so I really relate <laughs> to what these strangers are experiencing. And I just ask that you would be working in each of our hearts in this time. Um, be working all of this for good. I just ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds and our eyes and help us to see you and to see the truths that you have for us. Um, I feel like a lot of times in this kind of circumstance is when the Holy Spirit can really work because we're sort of forced to slow down and um, we're not able to engage in all of the routines that um, that typically distract us. And I just pray that you would help us to embrace the space that you have us in right now, that we would not run away, um, that we would just be able to really live in this space and um, that in that, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would teach us um, and reveal things to us that we may not have been able to see um, if this stuff had not happened. Um, I just pray that you would be um, with each one of my church friends, uh, wherever they're at right now, and whatever they're going through, um, the emotions that they're feeling, um, and just the, the different situations that they find themselves in, Lord. I just ask that you would uh, be with them, that you would reel yourself to them, and uh, speak truth into each one's heart, that you would bring clarity and a sense of peace in your presence. Um, I just pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Peace be with you all, church friends. Um, and I just can't wait again to see you all. I miss you so much. Um, take care, and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye. In 2008, Tammy, Quinn, and I moved from Portland, Oregon to San Antonio, Texas so that I could take a job as youth director at First Presbyterian Church, San Antonio. And i got to tell you, those first five months were ridiculously rough. We moved in August. Do you remember what was going on in August of 2008? It was the absolute worst time to try to move across the country and sell some real estate. It took us a good 10 months to finally sell our condo in Portland, and that's because we dropped it about 33% in price. I jokingly told people that we had a vacation property in Portland. It was the worst. But other things happened too. While at a Bible study on the campus of Alamo Heights High School, I accidentally threw a kid's keys on the roof of the field house. A hundred kids were out there watching me. It was so embarrassing, and I swear it was an accident. It's a long story. I'll share it when we have more time and where I have some tissue to dry my embarrassed tears. But it was the worst. It was the absolute worst. I was not starting my time at First Presbyterian Church as youth pastor on a good note. But there are other things as well. A couple of months into our time in San Antonio, somebody made a, a copy of our debit card, created a counterfeit debit card, and emptied out our checking account right after I got paid. We couldn't pay the bills that day. Though we eventually got our, our money back, it was a good three weeks before we had any sort of liquid funds for us to utilize. But the bottom fell out for me a couple of days before Christmas. We ended up getting robbed. Our, our house got broken into. All the presents under the Christmas tree were stolen. Our electronics, our computer, our camera, all of that stolen. My wife's jewelry, including things she had inherited from her grandparents, stolen. I remember feeling devastated. It wasn't so much about the stuff. I, I felt like I just couldn't take care and provide for my family. 
We already weren't making a ton of money. I was a part. I was a, a youth pastor that wasn't made making too much money, and and my wife didn't have a job at all. Meanwhile, we were paying double for lodging because we still hadn't sold our condo in Oregon, and then the money that we had was all taken. I couldn't protect us from a robbery. I couldn't protect us from a recession. It was overwhelming. The night we got robbed, I'll never forget, I was, I was holding baby Quinn. He was about 10 months old, and, and I was rocking him to sleep. And, and that night, in the darkness, I, I began to weep. I began to cry out to the living God. I, I began to ask questions like, like God, what's, what's going on here? Did I do something wrong? Did, did I misunderstand your calling on my life to move to San Antonio? God, where are you? Why is this happening to us? The reality is I still don't have answers to many of those questions. I I don't know why all those bad things happened at the same time. I I don't know why it was so hard. but, But what I do know is that on that night that I was rocking Quinn, that I was crying and and crying out to the living God, on that night, through my tears, all of a sudden, I realized that God was in my midst. It was like my eyes were were opened. I, I had a holy disruption. As I held my child that night in December, it was as though God was holding me. As I soothed my child that night in December, it was as though God was soothing me. This this theological statement of Emmanuel, I felt to my core. I was broken, I was afraid, but then I saw that God was in my midst. And the reality is, God didn't just happen to meet me at my lowest point. God had been there all along. But it was in my lowest place that I finally let go of my desire to control, that I, that I, I finally let the false securities fall to the ground because they weren't working very well for me anyway, that I, that I finally acknowledged my own limits, and I, and I finally allowed myself to be held, to be soothed, to be encompassed by the living God. In our text today, we see two followers of Jesus who had a holy disruption. Now, these were not members of the apostles, the inner circle, but they were disciples of Jesus. They were a part of his larger crew, say, so to speak. And they had just witnessed the brutal execution of the guy who they thought was going to be their revolutionary hero, the, the guy who was supposed to save them from Roman oppression. One of the saddest verses in this reading that, that Lauren just read was, We had hoped that this person was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped You see, they had hopes, they they had dreams, and all of that crashed down around them in a very violent manner. And we know that Jesus was the one who redeemed Israel. He was the one who redeemed the rest of the world, for that matter. But it didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. Nothing went according to their plans. Well, 2020 is not happening the way we thought it was going to happen. We too had hopes. We we too had dreams. This was not the way things were supposed to go. While I do not believe that God caused the pandemic, I, I do believe that God is at work in the midst of the pandemic. And so I must ask you and, and myself as well, What is the holy disruption for us today? What is God inviting us into in light of this catastrophe? In our text, these two disciples, one named Cleopas, the other 
that's, that, that is not named, they are on the road to a village called Emmaus. They were leaving Jerusalem. Perhaps they were going to stay in Emmaus for the rest of the festival of unleavened bread. And on this journey, they encountered a person they thought was a stranger. How often in our lives do we encounter the living God, but do not recognize God's presence among us? Verse 16 says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, I need to be honest with you. We don't really know exactly what that means. I read a few different commentaries, and all of them had a different take slightly, had a different take. But as I began to think about the way humans work, I I can't help but wonder if it was their own pain, their own grief, their own anxiety that made it hard for them to recognize the presence of Jesus, God in flesh, among them. I can't help but wonder if it was their their grief and their pain and their anxiety that, that made it hard for them to believe the testimony of those women that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. But what we know to be certain is, though they were unable to see Jesus, Jesus was not hiding from them. Jesus did not leave them Alone, They simply did not recognize the presence of Jesus in their midst. Again, think about your life for a second. It's so much easier for us to recognize the movement of God and the blessings of God when, when things seem to be going our way, when our hopes are being realized, when our dreams are being embodied. I guarantee you that I felt closer to God the day I got ordained as pastor in Word and Sacrament than the day I found out that my bank account had been emptied and we were sitting at zero. Meanwhile, my wife has no job. It's so much easier for us to recognize the movement of God when when life is going the way we want it to go. But as soon as things don't go as planned, it's hard for us to tell up from down. It's, it's hard for us to trust that God is indeed with us. It's, it's hard for us to trust that God is indeed for us. It's, it's hard for us to trust that Christ has indeed conquered death, that, that Christ has overcome the world. Now in our text, I, I love that Jesus began to ask questions. Clearly, our, our spiritual journey of discovery is important to our God. And so Cleopas asked the question, are are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place? And then Jesus plays dumb, doesn't he? He says, what things? (laughs) Cleopas uh, proceeds to tell the story of Jesus' life, arrest, and death. And by the way, notice that Cleopas emphasized the, the fact that it was his chief priests and his leaders that handed over Jesus to be killed. And then Cleopas utters that that heartbreaking statement. We had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem us. But it's too late. It's the third day and nothing. Now think about that for a moment. Looking at the resurrected Christ, Cleopas says, There is no sign of Jesus. All we have is the testimony of the women who who said they saw an angel who, who, who professed that Jesus had risen from the dead. One commentary I read said that Jesus responded to them in this way. You idiot! <laughs> Now, I, I don't think that's quite how Jesus said it or what Jesus said. I think that's a little a bit harsh, but I do think it's funny. It's hard for us to read Jesus say things like, oh, how foolish you are, with, without inferring some sort of shame. Because we've had people in our own lives who, who have used language like that to shame us, to embarrass us, to derail us. But Jesus is not that sort of person. God is not that sort of God. We do not have a God who wants to cripple us with shame. We have a God who wants to free us with truth. The word fool simply means unwise, not understanding. 
Jesus is basically asking them, in, in light of all that you have seen and heard, why is it so hard for you to believe? Why are you so slow to embrace this ultimate reality? Jesus is inviting them to step into reality, to draw near to truth. And the truth, well, the truth may sting a little, but it's like peroxide. It's just cleaning out the funk so that healing can begin. The truth of God is always rooted in love, always working so that we may be redeemed, restored, and reconciled. If Jesus' literal presence wasn't enough, Jesus then tried to help them understand who he was by pointing to Scripture, to, by pointing to how he fulfilled Scripture. So from Moses to the prophets, pretty much the entire Hebrew Bible at the time, Jesus began to tell stories. Later, these disciples admitted that as Jesus taught about the Scripture, their, their hearts began to burn inside of them. And yet still, their eyes were not open. Not yet, at least. Here's the thing, though. This is something I find pretty remarkable. In spite of their pain and their grief and their anxiety, they still practiced radical hospitality. They still invited the stranger into their homes to, to eat and to rest. In the ancient world, hospitality is seen as a religious virtue. In Luke 24, by, by practicing radical hospitality to the stranger, they entertained Jesus unaware. When they cared for a stranger who needed food and lodging, they literally cared for Jesus Christ. But then, Jesus moved from guest to host. He took the bread, and he blessed the bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. This is my body, blessed, broken, and given for you. And it was in that moment, in that sacred moment, that the disciples could finally see this was their holy disruption. They thought that all was lost. They feared that they would have to rethink everything. And sure enough, the person with whom they had been speaking about Christ was himself, Jesus Christ. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. And then, poof, Jesus vanished. He didn't just leave the text says he vanished, adding to the mystery of the resurrection. As soon as the disciples realized that Jesus had been among them, they, they couldn't wait any longer. Though it was likely late in the evening, probably early in the morning, maybe in the ones or the twos, they decided to go and to run and to tell the apostles what they had seen. And so they told the apostles that Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of of the bread, the body that is blessed, broken, and given for you. That's where they encountered, or at least realized, the risen Lord was with them. Now, I'm sure the disciples didn't want Jesus to leave them once they realized who he was. I'm sure they wanted Jesus to remain with them, to continue to hold their hands and walk with them on a daily basis, guide them in person, show them the way. But that time of Jesus' physical body being with them was no more. But now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, they were called to carry on this mantle, to be the body of Christ through the church. And we too, we are the church. We must continue living and teaching this story of, of the great God of creation becoming flesh, living, 
teaching, dwelling among us, and, and dying, but rising again so that we may be free. These days, many of us are on our own road to Emmaus. Things have not gone quite as planned. But as we walk and as we process, you have to know that God is with you. Though you may not see God, though you may not feel God, God is in your midst. There are four things from our text today that, that I think can, can, can help guide us as we go on our own road to Emmaus. They can be our roadmap of sorts. The first is this. We have to keep walking the road. Now, yes, you need to take time to grieve and to mourn and to lament the losses. There are real losses happening in our lives and in our world. It's only healthy and, I would say, essential for us to take the time to process those and to grieve those. But also, you have to keep moving forward. You have to keep walking the path that God has placed before you. And so get up. Get dressed, brush your teeth, and keep taking one small step of faith at a time. The second is this. We have to walk, but we have to walk in community. We, we cannot move forward alone. Now, I know this stay-at-home order makes that a little more challenging for us. We can't gather in person. We, we can't go to the movies. We can't gather at a coffee shop and, and talk about life. But listen, we are still in this together. It's, it's just now we have to look for creative ways to connect. This has to be a spiritual discipline. We must be proactive about pursuing community and going on this journey together. The third thing is this. We have to continue to tell the stories of what God has done, of, of where we have seen the revelation of Christ in the past. Now, Jesus did this, did he not? He, he pointed the disciples back to Scripture, all the passages that, that spoke of the coming Messiah. And as he began to, to tell about these stories, I, I wonder if, if he talked about the time it felt like all was lost, but then God parted the Red Sea. I wonder if they read about the time when it felt like all was lost, but then God shut the mouths of those pesky lions. I wonder if they, they read about the story when it felt like all was lost, but, but then God told the people of Judah who were living in Babylonian exile that they have not been forgotten, that, that God has plans for them, that God will, will prosper them, that there is a hope for them in the future. Perhaps God wants to remind us that even if it feels like all is lost, that there is no hope to be found on the road to Emmaus. Perhaps God wants to show us that death has died. Even when it's hard to see that, that Christ is with us, that God is making all things new. Another thing we can learn from these foolish disciples who are on the road to Emmaus is that we need to practice radical hospitality. One may argue that it was in the very act of them selflessly offering food and rest to the stranger that they were finally able to see that Christ had been with them all along. Now, God doesn't need our money. God can still make a way where there seems to be no way without us. But God does use us. God does bless us by helping us be able to learn more who he is and, and learn how to live in community. Somehow, God stirs inside of us and shapes us as we learn how to selflessly serve others. Now, the reality is hospitality will look different these days. But it still needs to be a virtue of the church. Perhaps you could go and do a prayer walk in your community. Perhaps you could ask God to reveal names of people who, who need a phone call, your friends, your, your family members, maybe even complete strangers. Perhaps you could pray and, and, and consider giving money to somebody who lost their job, somebody who has been furloughed. 
that you may not be able to invite people into your homes during this time, you can still invite people into your lives. You can still remind people that they are not forgotten, that they are loved. Now, I don't know when all of this will be over. I don't know when we can safely resume our public gatherings. I, I wish I did. I, I wish I could take all of this painful stuff away. But what I know is that God is at work. What I know is that God is with us. What I know is that for many of us, we are experiencing a holy disruption by coming to terms with our limitations and by learning how to trust the living God with every breath. What I know is that we have to keep living. We have to keep looking for the movement of God in our midst. We, we have to keep remembering ways God has moved and delivered us in the past. We, we have to tell, keep telling the good news of the gospel to ourselves and to the world around us who are aching for hope. We have to keep loving, serving, and practicing hospitality in the context of community. What I know is that God has not abandoned us. Jesus is on the road with us. Jesus meets us in our suffering. This, this is one of the greatest messages of Easter, that we have a God who meets us in our suffering. We are not alone. Church, you can trust this message. You can rest in this message. Will you join me in prayer? God, it's true that it's often so easy to recognize you when life is going well, but so hard to see you when life is not going the way we planned. So Lord, I ask for a holy disruption. Disrupt us all, Lord, that we may see you for who you truly are that we may draw closer to you, that we may learn how to love and serve those around us, that you may be glorified in our words and in our actions. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. 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 Join me now in confessing the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Though in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting a coming day, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty shine for his bones. He rose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever in the streets to Jesus, 
is forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his grave, Jesus my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he rose, he with the mighty triumph for his glory. He, he arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his face to reign. He arose. Church, I want to invite you now to receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you. And may the Lord give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, knowing that God is with you. Amen.